Hi, I'm Carrie Corbett Owen. I study the lives of centenarians, people around the globe who live to a hundred plus. And what I've discovered fascinates me because I believe that it's their consciousness, their beingness rather than their doings that leads to their health and great longevity. And today I'm going to be speaking to Professor Gerald Pollock from Washington State University. And he's best known for his two books called Cells, Gels and the Engines of Life and the Fourth Phase of Water. Based on the research I've been doing, I've got this growing idea that may at first seem a little strange, but really there's a lot of scientific backing for it, that within our cellular structure, within our watery cytoplasm, it holds the signature for our consciousness at some or other level. And so I'm investigating that, and those are some of the things that I'm going to ask Dr. Pollock about today. So Dr. Pollock, you know, you're most known for your discovery of EZ water. What is that? <laughs> EZ. Well, EZ is actually um, um, the, the, the name uh, fits with the concept of being easy to remember, but unfortunately it doesn't work because it doesn't always work because although in the U.S. it's uh, <laughs> the Z is, is pronounced Z, but uh, other places it's Z, so it's EZ water instead of EZ water, but nevertheless easy easy stands for exclusion zone and it, it describes an experimental observation that that began the study of this special water that it, that's inside this exclusion zone or, or EZ. And it, it turns out that this is a, a, a different phase of water. Um, water, water molecules uh, in a, say in a glass of water tend to be rand randomly oriented and bouncing around a furious number of times per second. But this water is different. This water is a bit like a crystal. They, all of the molecules are organized in some way. And, and this easy water or fourth phase water, as we um, otherwise call it, generally sits next to interfaces. That is, if you have some solid material um, and material needs to be so-called hydrophilic or water loving, and that is, you know, if you have the surface, surface if the surface is horizontal and you take a drop droplet of water and you drop it on that surface, if it spreads out, then it tends to be hydrophilic. And, and most materials are like that. Other materials like that are hydrophobic, that is water fearing, the water tends to beat up like on Teflon, for example. And we don't, we don't find easy water next to that. But uh, when ordinary water meets a surface that's hydrophilic, not always, but most, most often, the water transitions in, into, into this liquid crystalline organized easy or fourth phase water. And there's a lot of it. It's not just mm -hmm. one molecular layer. It extends to many, many layers. And so it's, it's, it's a rather substantial volume of water. Does that so my, under yep. my understanding is that you discovered that through an accident that happened with light. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. Well, it's not, not exactly so. The, the accident came from the fuel that's necessary to build this kind of uh, water. And um, <clears throat> so it, 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 what I mentioned a moment ago is that when the water meets the surface, it, the water near the surface transitions into uh, 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 this liquid crystalline water. So you're going from chaos to order. You're going from disorder to order. And uh, it's... Uh, a, a fundamental theme of uh, physical chemistry and thermodynamics that if you want to create order out of disorder, you need to put energy into it. Um, an example is um, is uh, your office or your bedroom. It, it gets messy with time. You know, you, you tend to deposit materials helter-skelter and nothing is organized. And then you discover months later, ouch, my, my, my room needs, needs uh, <laughs> straightening. And it requires time and energy to, to do it, to uh, re replace uh, um, items that need to be replaced, put in their proper position and get them ordered or organized. It's the same thing in other situations. So we, we couldn't figure out, we, we knew that the, at the time that this water was ordered and we didn't understand 
what kind of energy could be involved in making the transition between disorder um, and, and order. And, and then a student, an undergraduate student, we have quite a few <coughs> working in the laboratory there, kind of intrigued by this kind of um, fundamental, um, uh, the fundamental studies of, uh, of water. He was doing an experiment on the lab bench and <coughs> he was looking at uh, the EZ that I, I mentioned, uh, this exclusion zone region. And there happened to be a lamp sitting next to him. It was a gooseneck lamp and, and he did he, what he wasn't supposed to do, which is sort of what I encouraged them to do. He, he took the lamp and um, he illuminated the chamber and by golly, uh, the region that was illuminated, the exclusion zone grew wildly. So it didn't take a rocket scientist or any kind of uh, genius to figure out that, well, you know, if you're adding light, it gets bigger. Maybe the light or the photons, may maybe that's the energy that's responsible for building. And that led us on to um, uh, many detailed studies where we found indeed uh, that, that light, the energy from light is what builds easy water. And a particular light that we discovered is infrared light that is you know, longer than the visible wavelength. Uh, the, the wavelength, the most effective wavelength was about three micrometers. And if you shine three micrometer light on, onto a chamber where there's an easy, the easy grows wildly. We've seen it grow about up to 10 times. So, wow. so yeah, it, it was, uh, you might say, an accident by a student, but um, um, uh, you know, um, um, as a Louis good Pasteur, this one. It's a good one, yeah. I, um, how did Louis Pasteur say something like, chance favors the prepared mind? So this is all by chance, but we were looking for, you know, where's the energy come from? And the student found it. <laughs> wow. And another student, oh, go ahead, please. So Dr. Pollock, you know, what I'm thinking of is the human cellular system. And I'm thinking that, you know, our, the, the membrane around our cells is a hydrophilic um, membrane. Does easy water play a role in our cells? Yeah. Um, uh, first, let me address the membrane because a lot of people focus on the membrane because a lot of things are supposed to happen in the membrane, maybe more than I actually believe based on the evidence actually happens. And yes, um, uh, easy water should definitely form around the membrane. But the membrane is only a small volume fraction of the cell. The cell is filled with hydrophil hydrophilic entities. Um, you know, among, among the solids inside the cell, uh, majority of the solids is a protein. 70% or so of the solids are, are proteins. And then there are nucleic acids like DNA, RNA, and, and other macromolecules. And these macromolecules tend to have charged or hydrophilic surfaces for the most part. And they sit next to water. And the, and the cell is extremely crowded. There's not much room for water. And, and someone has computed that any, that no water molecule in the side, in, inside the cell sits more on average than uh, four or five water molecules distant from a hydrophilic surface. So, um, and we've, we found in the, in the laboratory that EZs can build up to million molecular layers, let alone four or five. And so, so from that, we, we surmise that most of the water, I wouldn't say all the water, but most of the water inside the cell is going to be easy water. And that fits with, uh, <clears throat> fits with, with the negative charge of, uh, of the cell. Um, there, there's a prevailing view that the negative charge comes from some membrane pumps and channels. I learned that myself about uh, 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago. I couldn't quite understand how it worked, but, but I think it's wrong. And, um, and there are many reasons why, but we, we don't need to go into them. But a very simple explanation for the negative charge of the cell is that the cell is filled with easy water and easy water has a negative charge. So, you know, you, you take a sack and fill it with substances or a substance that has negative charge and the whole sack is going to be negatively charged. It may have nothing to do with the membrane, although, yes, the membrane is hydrophilic and so it should build easy water next to it. Yeah. So you mentioned um, infrared light and I know you've written about sunlight as well. And I'm curious about how you think infrared and sunlight affect the human battery, if I can call it a battery. Yeah, you can call it a battery because um, because um, 
uh, EZ water is negatively charged, and 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 the water beyond the EZ is equally positively charged. So you have negative and positive, and that's the essence of a battery, and and that's uh, fueled by uh, by light. Uh, sorry, your question was. Um, what, yeah, I was just curious about the role of sunlight oh, and sunlight. Yeah, yeah, red I'm light. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, well, so sunlight um, gives us light of many different wavelengths. So the one that we focus on mostly is the visible wavelengths running from uh, violet all the way to the longer wavelengths red, but it also contains infrared, that is wavelengths longer uh, than red, and also contains ultraviolet, which is shorter than violet. So, so the sun produces a fairly wide spectrum, uh, including, including infrared. And, um, and even, even though the amount of infrared is not, uh, not nearly as much as the, the amount of, of uh, visible light, still it's there and, there's, it, and it's abundant. And so, so if we sit in the sun, uh, the sun's rays will penetrate our body and, and um, um, depending on a particular wavelength, some of the wavelengths will penetrate fairly deeply and some less deeply, but, but they all, they're all incident on our body and we receive that light and therefore the, the easy water that's in our body uh, should build. Uh, you should get more easy water and if you're deficient in easy water and you go out in the sun, one reason why you might feel good when you go out in the sun, uh, especially here in Seattle where we have perpetual gloom in the winter when the sun peeks through the clouds and we feel really good. And, and you know, part of it uh, probably has to do with our psyche. And another part may be actually physically based and that we simply receive this energy, the infrared energy, which builds easy water. And what I neglected to mention is that easy water is critical for everything we do. You might you might label it uh, hydration or cellular hydration. We need it. We, we all know that. We don't function if we're dehydrated. We function very poorly. And, and easy water is, is basically uh, hydration of the cell. And put in, in different terms, uh, um, you know, uh, um, m most biological scientists understand that when a cell does whatever work it's uh, supposed to be doing, um, it does it when the appropriate protein, the relevant protein folds. That is, it goes from a, say, uh, uh, a long extended unfolded state to a folded state. Uh, and I, you know, there's obviously some, some truth to this, but what's, what's often um, omitted is, is the idea that the folding that occurs that <clears throat> each protein is surrounded by easy water. So the natural state for a protein is uh, the protein plus the easy water that clings to it. And together they make up an entity. So when a protein folds, it involves not only the protein, but the water that surrounds it. That is the natural state inside your cell for every protein, whether it's a muscle protein and a muscle cell that leads to contraction, or whether it's a protein in a nerve cell that um, facilitates communication. It's always the protein plus the water. So now, if you happen to be dehydrated or deficient in in water, you see, then the protein is is, is finds itself in in a strange state because because it doesn't have the usual charges from the easy water around it, and it may easily not fold or misfold or something. And therefore, your muscle or your nerve or whatever cell we're talking about is not functioning properly, you see? So, so the hydra cellular hydration of easy water is absolutely critical for all function. So when you receive sunlight or infrared light uh, from somewhere, that, that confers health because it builds easy water and the easy water is critical for function. So I think it's a you know, fairly straightforward paradigm. Uh, yeah. We must have that easy water. <laughs> You also talk about blood flow, and I was see, looking and seeing that plasma is about 92% water. And I was wondering what role easy water plays in, you know, the circulation of our blood and blood flow. Yeah, that's a, a really, really good question. Um, we actually found something profound. Um, and we, have, we haven't published it yet, but it's coming, coming very close. I uh, mean, I've got a scoop yet. I'm sorry, it's you. I've got a scoop here. <laughs> uh, no, 
it's okay. I, I, I've been talking about this when I give lectures and such. It's not, it's not, it's not a secret by any means. But, uh, so let, let me, um, let me, let me convey this on, on two levels. First of all, in the blood plasma, you know, we have a plasma plus the red blood cells and they have to squeeze through all the vessels. And um, um, if, if you have a lot of easy water in the plasma, this is a problem. This can be a problem because easy water is, is gel-like. Um, it has the consistency, you might say, of honey or something. And you don't want honey in your blood vessels because, because the blood it needs to flow easily and readily through, through your vessels. Um, and you don't want it to get clogged up because if it clogs up, then you, you obviously you have a problem. And so we haven't studied it, but my guess is in the plasma itself, there's probably not a whole lot of easy water. Although I don't think anybody has studied, so nobody knows for sure. But we did discover um, something that I, I, I would like to uh, talk to you uh, about a little bit. And that is, you know, everybody, everybody knows that the heart is responsible for pumping blood through the cardiovascular system. And no doubt, no doubt it is. I, I mean, it, um, but there's something else. And that's what I want to tell you. There's something that assists the heart that people hadn't known about. And, and we have now pretty clear evidence for that. So I, I, I back up a step. Um, we, we found several years ago, and this one is published and, and also appears in my fourth phase of water book. Um, we found that if we take a tube, just like a straw made of, excuse me, made of uh, hydrophilic material and, um, and we put this tube inside the water, um, just lay it horizontally inside the water, we, we found that the water flows through the tube and it doesn't stop, it just keeps flowing either one way or the, or the other way. And we've done many control experiments uh, uh, w w w to, to determine that this is a, a, a real phenomenon. And what's, what's odd about it is that usually you need pressure to drive flow through a tube. Um, so for example, for your large vessels inside your body, the heart is responsible for building that pressure and driving the blood through. And in any kind of pipe, you need to pressure, put pressure on one end to drive the flow uh, through. This is a situation, the one I just described, where there's no pressure, no pressure gradient, that is no pressure difference from one end to the other end, and still it flows. And so when, when the student came, uh, another one of those undergraduate students came running in to my office uh, to tell me this, and I was sitting and chatting with some probably very important visitor, I can't remember exactly who that was, but he came running in, he came barging in, uh, he said, you know, I found something pretty interesting. And I looked up and I, oh, oh what, what have you found? He said, the flow just keeps going and going, doesn't want to stop. And I thought it was interesting. He said, well, I thought to myself, this is more than interesting because where does the energy come from? This seemed to be, if the student was correct and we found that he, he was correct, if he's correct, then, then the energy, we, we knew by that time that the water is absorbing energy, absorbing light or infrared energy from the environment. The environment is full of infrared energy and and this would be the ultimate proof of that because where else can the energy come from since there's no pressure gradient so i was really excited about it we launched a whole bunch of studies and we published several papers on this and and we found this is this is a real phenomenon so what how does that relate to um to to the cardiovascular system and such well um um i think it relates directly because because we found that a mechanism similar to what we found in the laboratory may be operating in your and, and my blood vessels. And, and all of this started with a, a visit to Moscow where I went to, um, to uh, chat with my friend and colleague, colleague Vladimir Vayekov, who is the vice chair of biochemistry um, at Moscow University, which is you know, there best known uh, university. And, and we had a nice time chatting. And he said, uh, Jerry, you know, I'd like you to meet the guy who's in the next door laboratory. And I met the guy and I was told that he's doing, doing some work with the cardiovascular system. And the meeting um, with this guy, he sat down next to us and it shocked me. What he said shocked me. It shocked me because 
as a graduate student, I, I had studied the cardiovascular system, the mechanics, dynamics, and I knew something about pressure and flow. And in fact, I guess I was arrogant enough to think that we had all the answers until I met this guy. And, and the guy is telling me, he says, well, there's a big problem in the cardiovascular system. And I said, oh, really? Tell me, I'm expecting almost nothing. But, but uh, what the guy told me shocked me. He says, you know, look, think about it. Um, you have a capillaries and the capillaries are pretty small. So in, in healthy young adults, maybe not someone like myself, but healthy young adults, <laughs> the, uh, the capillaries, the capillaries are only uh, three to four micrometers in diameter, three to four, but the red blood cells that need to pass through them are almost twice the size, six or seven micrometers. So, so he said, uh, this, is, this is a real, a real problem because uh, how, how do these red blood cells squeeze through? Well, um, we knew um, that what actually happens is the red cells tend to bend like this and then they squeeze through. But he says, uh, you know, the amount of energy that's required to squeeze them through to accomplish the bending is so large that it's impossible for the heart to do the entire job. And I started scratching my head and thinking, hmm, this guy, this guy has a point. Uh, so he said he did some calculations. And, and if the heart itself were fully responsible for this, the heart would need to develop a pressure that would be something like a million times the pressure that it actually develops. There's a huge uh, pressure, and obviously it doesn't. So he said, something else has got to be responsible. He was thinking something about bubbles, bursting bubbles or collapsing bubbles. I actually didn't pay so much attention to his explanation because immediately um, the neurons started firing. And I'm thinking, oh, gee, you know, in our laboratory, we just saw that you take a tube, a hydrophilic tube, just like capillary, and you put it in water and the flow goes through automatically. And, and we, we kind of knew or understood what, how, the, how that mechanism worked in those tubes in the laboratory. So I'm thinking maybe that's the solution. Maybe the smaller vessels have their own self-propulsion systems that help drive um, those red blood cells through. So it seemed like a, you know, a, a hypothesis worth testing and we tested it. My, my student, Zhong Li, uh, <clears throat> from China uh, started doing it. And, and he looked at uh, the chick embryo, a very three day old chick embryo. So the embryo is growing, but it hasn't developed all the complicated uh, feedback systems and such, it's uh, rather primitive. And so you can access it easily. You take the fertilized egg and you lop off the top uh, of it, the, uh, the shell, and there you, there you see, um, see the embryo and you can look at it in the microscope and and started, and he did that. So he tested, what he did was he stopped the heart and you can do that easily by applying potassium chloride. And the first thing he noticed is that even though the heart is stopped, the blood keeps flowing. It doesn't flow nearly as fast, but it keeps flowing. And so, so obviously something is pushing the blood and it's not the heart, you see. So, so that, that was the first interesting observation. And then the key observation that we already knew from a previous uh, e experiments and, and such that if you add light, um, especially infrared, it goes faster, you see. And so, so he, we thought if this is the mechanism that's really operating that keeps the blood flowing, uh, we're gonna try to add infrared energy and see if it goes faster. So he tried it and the results showed that it went like three times faster if he applied the infrared energy. So we, we think that um, this mechanism is operative biologically. And if it's operating in the chick, it's probably operating in you and, and me, you see. And, and so, so it appears now, uh, if, if our experiments are properly interpreted and properly carried out, it, it looks like we have two mechanisms inside of us for driving blood. Uh, the first is the heart, which obviously uh, um, uh, drives the blood into the larger arteries and maybe some of the smaller vessels. And then when we get down to, to the tiny vessels, to the, like the capillaries um, or the, the small arterioles, it, it looks like this, what we call self-driven flow is operating as well to assist the heart and to, to drive the blood. So, 
if this is true, it may have clinical uh, implications because it would, it would appear that um, all you need to do is add infrared energy and, and sluggish blood you can get to, to, uh, to flow faster. And, uh, so I don't know that this has actually been, been tried, but it's one of the implications. So we're really excited about this because it, it's, um, um, you know, it, it's a direct outcome of our, our studies on water. So we're excited. Wow. Well, it strikes me, if I remember correctly, that at night, even everything in our room gives off infrared. Am I correct in saying that? Absolutely. So, if you uh, at night <clears throat> your your room is darkened, and even if the room is completely dark, um, <coughs> no visible light. So, you take your smartphone camera. I have none. No smartphone. I think I'm the last person on the earth. Uh, if you take your camera, <laughs> you'll see nothing. You'll get no image because there's no visible light that's coming to the lens of the camera. But if you take an infrared camera instead of a visible light camera, and we have a couple in our laboratory, if you take the infrared, um, uh, you get a beautiful image of everything. And if I were imaging you, I'd, uh, I'd see you. I'd see the frog in the background. and. Um, and I don't know what's next to the frog, but uh, an interesting sculpture or prize or award or something. Everything is generating in the file cabinet as well. Everything and your necklace. Uh, everything is generating infrared, and so it means it means that um, it's there for the offering. It, it's free. So the chemists like to talk of free energy, and what they mean is free energy that comes from that comes from molecular bonds, but this is actually literally free energy because it, it doesn't cost a nickel. It's there for the taking. And because it's there, because it's there all the time, it means that easy water is present all the time because the energy, the ambient infrared energy that's not, that just doesn't disappear day or, or night is there to fuel the buildup of easy water. So we all, so all over, wherever you have water and you have a hydrophilic surface that's not far away, that's an appropriate hydrophilic surface, you have easy water. And if you were to add more infrared, um, and, and there's a side issue that deals with health, if you add more infrared, um, then you get more of it. Uh, you, you get a um, um, uh, buildup of, of easy water. Um, and, and, um, and so it's a very simple system. You've got light energy, it comes in, it builds easy water. You need easy water. Um, mm. It sounds to me almost like we've got the sunlight that fuels us and we've got infrared that fuels us through the mech, through through the easy water. Almost like, you know, I, I think you said that something like 90% of our um, volume by atoms or, at, you know, the atomic material is actually water. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, we all, we all know about the two thirds of us are water. That's by volume. And by the way, I think many people know it changes with age. So... Um, <clears throat> when you get to be long in the tooth, you don't have the ratio of water to solids it diminishes. So we're, we're all, older people tend to be dehydrated. Um, newborns are just full of water. They may be 85% water, and I'm probably 65% water, uh, etc. So so it 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 um, it does diminish. Um, but the figure the 99%. Uh, figure is sometimes tends to be confusing for some people. The, it refers to a molecular count. So, mm -hmm. so you know that uh, water molecule is so small that to um, to make up that uh, two thirds volume, you got to put a lot of those tiny molecules in to to fill it up. So, so if you were to to strip the cell of all its molecules and line them up and start counting one, two, three, four, more than ninety nine out of a hundred of the molecules are water molecules. And just a, just a side point about that, you know, it's kind of ironic that um, biological scientists who study mechanisms for the most, most part, not all, but for the most part, ignore the water. They think the water is merely the background carrier of the more important molecules of life. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of, you might say arrogant uh, to think that that ninety nine percent of your molecules do nothing, <laughs> um, and many people earlier knew that the water was central to all that that is going on. Yeah, uh, it, um, 
starts starts back with with um, well many scientists. The one I think of the first is is um, uh, Albert Saint Georgi. Uh, Saint Georgi is considered to be the father of modern biochemistry. He won a Nobel Prize for discovering vitamin C. He discovered he studied muscles. He studied cancer, and mostly he was interested in water. And he said, "Life is water dancing to the tune of solids." So he knew I love that. that. I read that I, in your book. Just oh yeah, <laughs> just, you know it was. I thought it was such a beautiful saying, and it also reminded me that um, Dr. Bruce Lipton said that you know if you think about it, for many decades scientists <laughs> have spent their time studying what they think was you know the the carrier of life, which is DNA, but actually completely not studying the watery cytoplasm. Yeah. And so one of the things that I'm curious about is, you know, you talk about easy waters being like a gel-like substance. And it seems to me that there's lots of research coming out that says water has memory. And I'm wondering if, you, if there's any kind of biological memory that our cells hold that you know about. Well, yeah. Um, so... Uh, is a, I'm trying to think of where to start because it's a, it's, a, it's a, a rather complex topic. And there's a lot of research that's going on um, about the memory of, of water. And I, um, uh, and I know you're familiar with, with some of it. And so I, I guess a good, good place to start is, is uh, are the Emoto experiments. Um, um, done by the, the late um, Masaru Emoto mostly, and now being carried on by uh, his, you might say, his disciples who continue in, in the same pathway. And, and, um, and what, what he found is that if you, if, you di, di, if, you, if you take water and then freeze it, but if prior to freezing you, you direct some kind of energy to the water, it could be sound energy, it could be um, your emotions that you're projecting, um, and various others, that it affects the, um, the crystalline structure of the water that forms. Um, uh, scientists m m most, mostly uh, um, uh, take his work not so seriously because there was a certain amount of cherry picking of the particular results that he, he preferred, but he claimed, you know, he is a spiritualist, not a scientist, and that's okay. But uh, it seems that it seems that some information can be imparted to to uh, water. Now, uh, this was actually um, um, uh, a, stu a subject that was studied by the late Jacques Benveniste, who was a pioneering uh, French scientist. Um, and Jacques basically lost his career, if not his life, um, uh, because of experiments that he carried out that showed that water really does have memory that you could put information into it um, and that information would 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 come out um, it's a it's a long complicated and uh, kind of uh, unpleasant story but Jacques was Jacques was a famous immunologist whose whose work uh, is in every immunology textbook and he was he was studying uh, uh, certain kinds of cells that um, secrete I think histamine um, uh, and and someone came to him and and, um, and, and said you know um, you you offer some antibodies to this kind of uh, uh, um, uh, to these cells and it, which makes them a secrete but I can show you that I can I can take those antibodies and dilute and dilute and dilute them so that there's really nothing left except uh, uh, essentially water and get the same result. And he said, uh, impossible. But he also, being an open-minded guy, he said to the guy, okay, you know, we have a big laboratory. There are some 50 people there, which was later reduced to zero because of the consequences of, of what he produced. And um, <clears throat> show your experiment. And pretty soon everybody was huddled in the corner of that laboratory seeing, seeing the results because it, it appeared since since essentially what what appeared to be water produced the same effect as the original antibodies. The idea was that the water retained the information that the antibodies had because the antibodies were very specific, and so it looked as though the water took on that specificity. 
Well, it was ridiculed. And part of the ridicule was, was un understandable because if water, if water uh, really consists of randomly oriented molecules that are bouncing around a huge number of times per second, it's hard to imagine that those molecules could store information of any kind. Um, and, and that was part of the reason that, that he was rejected. And he ran into uh, great difficulty, especially when he wanted to publish his paper in the journal Nature. They wrote back saying, uh, this is impossible because if you're right, everybody else is wrong. And I read the editor said, uh, Sir John Maddox, I, I refuse to believe that everybody else is wrong. And therefore, therefore, you you must be wrong. And so Jacques went to um, colleagues and said, please repeat my experiment. They got the same result. They submitted together. And the consequence was pretty much the same. And pretty soon, uh, there was a, a lot of objection from Paris where he was he was working across the channel in London where nature had its offices and they were under a lot of pressure. And so Jacques told me, told me the story um, <clears throat> that he got a call from the editor of nature. He said, see that phone over there? Um, I, got a, I got a call from John Maddox, no, it became Sir John Maddox. And he said, I'll make a deal with you. I'll publish your paper in nature, which is, you know, good. But I want to send, uh, send a committee of peers over to, uh, to look and see what, what's going on. Would you agree to it? And of course, he said yes, because I, I think Jacques was um, uh, basically a, an honest, uh, very open-minded guy. And so they made that, they struck the deal, it happened. And within a month or so, Sir John Maddox um, got together um, a, a group of peers, it was supposed to be peers, uh, to look over their shoulders and then report back to nature. The peers turned out to be an interesting group. The group consisted of Maddox himself, who, who uh, had a bone to pick to begin with. And the second one was the amazing Randy. Uh, that's, that's James Randy, magician, famous magician. And, uh, and obviously he was brought on to figure out what kind of trick the French were playing because the assumption was that water memory is impossible, you see. Um, and the third one was a guy named Walter Stewart. And uh, Walter Stewart worked for the National Institutes of Health Department of Scientific Integrity. Um, people who are cheating, you know, they wanna figure out. And so this was obviously a, a, a commando committee um, and, um, and the committee went and visited. And uh, from what I understand, they did uh, three separate experiments. And the first two were done by the technician in the French laboratory that ordinarily did it. And the experiments seemed to work uh, the same way as reported. And the third time, it was one of the visitors who did the dilutions in the experiment. And apparently, it didn't work. And so they huddled. And they concluded that because when the French do it, it works. And when the British do it, it doesn't work. So it must be a trick. Um, and, and so they published in Nature a month after the original publication that water memory is a delusion, a trick, in, in other words. And, and, and so um, Jacques Benveniste and water memory became the laughing stock of the scientific community. Someone would say, you know, you, you're having trouble having trouble memory, re remembering stuff, why don't you drink some of the Benvenist water and restore your, your memory? It was a joke. And I, I remember when I started to write my previous book, The Sales, Gels, and the Engines of Life, someone reminded me of that. Actually, I hadn't even known about that, that incident and I found out about it and said, be careful because, uh, you know, if you dipping, dipping your toes into the water can be really treacherous. So anyway, um, now we know that the results of Jacques Benveniste are correct because they've been re repeated by countless people. In fact, he's become one of the heroes, um, one of the heroes, a persecuted hero. <laughs> of course, he lost everything after this. Uh, they would never give him money to carry out his experiments. Um, at our water conference each year in October, coming actually in a couple of weeks, is the annual conference on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water. It's in Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it's a really 
exciting conference. This year we have Nobel laureate Luc Montagnier, who in fact is interested in water uh, memory. And at, at this conference, Jacques Benveniste has become a kind of hero um, because his results were maligned and discredited, yet other people have been able to repeat the results. So, so water memory is, is, um, uh, appears to be something real. Uh, quite a few people have begun working on it. And to conclude, I'm sorry, this long brief, <laughs> brief question, just to conclude, see, I, I think that, that the scientific community is correct in thinking that ordinary water can't really store information because of the random molecules that are bouncing around. But easy water is different. It's a crystal and crystals can store information. See, your, your um, um, thumb drive is basically made of silicon uh, or silicon dioxide crystal and it stores information. And, and the easy is similar. It's a, it's a crystalline structure that consists of oxygen and hydrogen and it should have the same or similar capacity to store information. So that, I think, is where the, the that's the substrate for information storage in water. It's the easy water rather than the bulk water. Yeah. And you know, Dr. Pollock, I mean, I've read um, Luc Montagnier's um, paper, and it seems to me that, I mean, water even remembers DNA and can reconstitute DNA after many, many dilutions when it's actually sent to foreign laboratories. And so it, it's interesting, you know, I mean, it's exciting to me that he's a Nobel laureate. So hopefully, you know, his work will also be taken a little bit more seriously. I hope so too, uh, you know, at, a, at our water conference. So he, he comes frequently and he'll be there in two weeks in Sofia uh, to report on his latest findings. But um, his, his work, despite his uh, credentials, his Nobel credentials, um, his work is, is, uh, is, is, is not taken seriously by most of the scientific community. I, I heard, heard the story from one of his colleagues, um, um, different at our conference where he's a hero, uh, but uh, when he presented it, there's an annual meeting in a place called Lindau in Germany, an annual meeting of Nobel laureates from all different fields. They get together um, annually and they invite postdocs, uh, 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 the, the ones who, who are kind of handpicked to be the most promising, who get to rub shoulders with all of those Nobel laureates. And of course there are presentations. And he presented, uh, he presented his talk and his colleague who was there with him uh, kind of whispered to me that, that um, they, they uh, really didn't like what he had to say. And I, I met with um, uh, a colleague of mine who's also a Nobel laureate in biochemistry. And we had coffee afterward and we got to talking about that Lindau meeting where Luke uh, presented and he was shaking his head and he said, Boy, this is the biggest nonsense I ever heard. You see, so, so, uh, um, so there's a lot of skepticism out out there from from many scientists who simply can't believe that that this can be correct. And yet, you know, he keeps pressing on with very interesting experiments and and information. And um, um, so, uh, this is an exciting time to be involved with water. It is. So, Dr. Pollock, I've got one more little thing that really puzzles me that, that I think about thing. a lot. Only and one. That, only one. <laughs> and that's that, you know, whatever cellular signals are coming into our cells actually have to traverse easy water in order to access our DNA. And in order it, to ex sorry, to, to access our DNA access. material. Oh, yeah. yeah, you know, in the, in the nuclear. And you know, now we know that each DNA strand can become something like 30,000 different proteins. And so I'm curious about the signal and how it possibly changes what <coughs> DNA is accessed and actually written and becomes a protein. Do you know anything about that kind of research? Um, well, a simple response is no. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, don't, we don't do that. Um, and um, it's a, um, maybe a not so, so uh, simple question, but uh, I, I guess, or not a simple answer. <laughs> that, uh, um, I, I, I guess that um, uh, w one approach to answering the question is that 
that the information is not necessarily so localized. Once the information gets into the cell, it could be that a large fraction of the water in the cell retains that that information. So, um, and this could be could be the way that the information can gain access to the uh, to the DNA. You know, the DNA is surrounded by some kind of structured water. We assume it's easy water, and if that water if that water can can um, um, access information from the DNA or impart even to the DNA, then then the the answer is is there. So we know about the long distances because um, we can imagine from a high, starting from a hydrophilic surface, the EZ builds in layers, sheets, and each sheet has a hexagonal structure. So, so you have uh, you know the first sheet, the second sheet, they stack on one another, and if the information um, comes from the nucleating surface, see every molecule has a different array of charges, and these charges may hold the information. Um, they can stack, you see, and the information can be imparted to many different layers. And you can also get information from outside, from electromagnetic signals, and it's possible that that information then is imparted to many, many layers, not just one layer. And so in that way, you can, or signal could reach from the periphery of the cell all the way to the nucleus of the cell and perhaps access the DNA. I mean, this is, this is the frontier to figure out how, how this actually works. But step one is, is for people to open their minds to say, well, th this seems most um, unlikely, but you know, the evidence shows otherwise, so we need to pay some attention to it. Um, scientists uh, have a, a kind of tendency to be um, maybe less open-minded than we might um, like to give them credit for because you know we scientists are human beings and we we um, we relish a sense of security uh, we like to be to think that we kind of know how things operate maybe a few answers are not all there but but we're pretty much on firm ground in, in understanding the principles of science and uh, the, uh, the 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 more i'm in science the more i i realize that that's not true that even even many of the basic principles that we take for granted, it's not so clear that they're correct. Um, and there needs to be an open mind about, about paying attention to, to uh, possible revision of our fundamental thinking. But we don't, we don't like to do that because, because we like to have a feeling of stability. You know, we're, <laughs> we're supposed to be knowledgeable about science. We know everything there is to know about our respective fields, <laughs> but uh, it ain't so. Uh -huh. I know. Well, you know, I have I have this wild, crazy idea that part of our watery cytoplasm holds a unique signature that is identifiable as us, as our consciousness. And I know that that sounds very out there, but I just have a feeling that every single person, just like you have a unique fingerprint and tongue print, has a unique biochemical signature that's stored somewhere in their cytoplasm. Uh, I'd buy that. That sounds uh, in, entirely reasonable. And uh, you should come to our water conference um, uh, and listen to what people have to say in chat. Um, it's uh, the URL is waterconf.org. Um, and there's still time if you can get to uh, <laughs> to Sophia. I would love to. <laughs> it's in a couple of weeks. Just, uh, yeah, it starts uh, just almost exactly two weeks, uh, the 18th of October. Um, That's fantastic. Dr. Pollock, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And it's been fun chatting with you. Okay. Thank you. Take you care. have a great day. You too. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye.